I'm Talia, Talia Conkle. I did my undergrad at UC Berkeley. I'll stand, actually, because I know I was going to be anyway. Um, I studied math and uh, cognitive science, so similar. Um, I noticed a lot of double majors, some interesting bio and computer science combos. It turns out I use that all the time. Um, so maybe that can appeal to some of you. Um, after undergrad, I went to MIT for grad school, so I'm back home. Um, I worked in Oda Leva's lab, so she um, is now in the computer science department, but she sort of studied computational vision and understanding how computer models can process the scenes around us. And so I have a background in sort of a slight computer vision. Um, and then uh, I went to postdoc at Harvard. Actually, I got this really sweet postdoc where it was half in Italy, half in Harvard. So I spent one year in Italy up in the Northern Alps um, of, of Italy. And then I've been at Harvard since. And actually, I just got hired as a professor at Harvard. And today is my first official day as a professor. <laughs> <laughs> so it can happen. Um, <laughs> um, so what I'm going to tell you about today is um, broadly the large-scale organization of object knowledge. This is a big topic and I study a small sliver in this, so I'm going to try and give you an overview um, and a little bit of what I do. Um, but rather than sort of go through the history of all the things that's been studied, I kind of wanted to get I'm trying something new. I'm going to have do an exercise, and I'm going to need your participation. So instead of talking through what's been done, I'm going to try and invite you to think about the problems um, um, from first principles. But to get started, the main questions are about object representation. So I put up a smattering of objects. We can recognize them easy, easily, effortlessly. That's a corn dog, a hippopotamus, airplane seats, a hair clip. I mean, these are pretty random objects, but no problem knowing what they are. And also, a lot of things about them. You know how you interact with them. You know where you typically find them. You know what they're for. So we have all this rich and structured knowledge that makes this just effortless. And the question broadly is, how is all of that knowledge represented and organized in our brains? So where is object knowledge stored in the brain? How is it organized? In what format is the object information stored? Is the representation? These are abstract, esoteric questions, but they're really at the core of it. So maybe we'll get into understanding what that means as we go. And then also sort of developmental questions. What factors give rise to this organization through experience, what's built in, and why is it organized the way it is? So those are sort of major core questions that the field of visual cognitive neuroscience is working on right now. And I'm going to focus mostly on this question of organization. So broadly, my methods, um, I do human neuroimaging, so put people in the scanner, um, and a lot of sort of computational modeling, um, behavioral studies or computer vision models to understand different features and properties of objects. And then I try and take neural measurements and take behavioral measurements and understand how they're linked, in particular, by looking at how information is organized across the cortical surface. So we're talking about the spatial organization of different response properties. I'm mostly going to assume you guys are somewhat familiar with fMRI, because I know Rebecca Sachs went before. But if you ever have any questions like, what method are you using, just jump in. In fact, in general, interrupt me um, as much as you want. I'd much rather have this be interactive. OK, so the outline for today is just getting oriented. And this um, exercise we're going to do together, which I've never done, the grocery store dilemma. Then I'm going to tell you some empirical results about object organization, just to get, get um, we'll go into a little bit of detail so you can see some of the nitty gritty methods. And then at the end, we'll talk about some ongoing explorations and the bigger picture of what this field, where this field is going. So getting oriented, let's talk about neuroanatomy. This is a side view of a human brain that's been partially inflated. So you can see inside, Are people oriented roughly front of the brain, back of the brain, ventral stream, dorsal stream. OK, so I'm going to be throwing up brain pictures at you left and right, so I just want to make sure everyone's oriented. So here's the side of the brain. If you were to roll it down and be looking at the bottom of the brain, like up the spinal cord, so this is ventral surface. Everyone oriented, see that? Um, I'll often show brains like like in this orientation. And you can think of this cortex as sort of one continuous band of cortex that goes from the lateral to the 
central surface. And along there are some major um, psi and gyri, which we'll be sort of paying attention to later. So this is um, parapocampal gyrus, fusiform gyrus. It's not important that you know what they are, but just sort of knowing the course anatomy is going to be important going on. OK, so you can take the lateral view and swing it around. So now we're looking at the back, this is the occipital pole, the back of the brain. Um, that red line, that's the intraparietal sulcus running up the dorsal stream. And if you keep rotating it, swing it around, now this is the medial view. So if you were only looking at the inside of one hemisphere. So this is the calcarine fissure. This is where our primary visual cortex is. So in a way, you kind of got to imagine this rotating brain to get a sense of all of these views. Everyone oriented anatomically. Have people stared at inflate, partially inflated human brains before, or is this the first? Let me ask that again. How many people are just seeing partially in inflated human brains for the first time? OK, so we have some exposure, some newness. She's looking like this could be confusing. So at any point in time, if you're lost, let me know. OK, primary sensory areas, primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex, primary motor and primary sensory cortex. So when you go to understand the organization of cortex, we know there are certain areas and we draw them with blobs and we go, this does this, this does that. So these are some of the like first core primary sensory areas. And then there's a lot of stuff in between and we're still, we don't quite know how to draw the blobs and how to label them. We're still like really in this navigating, what does this cortex do? How do we draw blobs? How do we label them? How do we think of how it's all going together? Um, and in particular, I focus on the part that's responsive to viewing objects compared to viewing nothing. So this is a contrast looking at where there's increased blood activation when you're viewing just pictures of objects versus viewing a, a blank screen. And in general, you can see lots of early visual cortex going on down. This is the ventral stream. There's a little bit on the lateral surface. That's the dorsal stream. We're going to focus just on the ventral stream. And this has classically been divided as the what pathway and the where pathway. We're just working on the what pathway for now. And the question is, we know that all this cortex is responding to objects, but is some responding to some kinds of objects and some responding to others? And you know, what's the scale of these parcellations? In other words, what kind of object information is where across this big swath of cortex? What are the functions and what's the responsiveness of different regions? And of course, this question is actually doubly tricky because there's different scales of organization. So if we consider the primary motor cortex, it is there with respect to, say, somatosensory and premotor. Within the primary motor cortex, there's further subdivisions for different control of different body part movements. Within there, there's further subdivisions. So in general, trying to label what par a, you know, a part of the brain does is a multi-scale problem. So we want to understand sort of multiple levels of organization that are existing simultaneously. OK, so why does organization matter? Why is this interesting to understand how information is laid out on the cortical surface? Introducing the grocery store dilemma. Pretend you have inherited these foodstuffs, and it is your job to lay them out in a small room. <laughs> how do you do it? If it were me, my favorite grocery store organization would probably be something like a meal-based organization. So you walk along, and to your left, there's the hamburger meat, the buns, the cheese, the beer, and the salt and pepper to season the meat. And boom, all you have to do is grab those ingredients, and you've got your burger meal. Then you've got your pasta with shrimp or chicken with pasta. And basically, as you walk along, you can just grab all the things you need for a meal, and then you're done. This is awesome for people like me who are poor cooks and who are browsing. You don't necessarily know exactly what you want, but you know you need a meal. What are the cons of this organization? Yeah, go ahead. That's OK. What? Right. So, wait, so if I understood that correctly, if, if you're picking for a meal, it's very easy to shop. Right. 
but if so now what's why, why would this not be you're the grocery store manager or organizer why is this not yeah, go ahead why is this bad or why is this harder that's right I think that's sort of what you were saying too which is what if the variant of the meal that I want isn't in there now how do I even start to find it any other cons yeah That's right. Like, even if you know you want meals, how do you even find where the meal is? Um, you had one, yeah? There's lots of replication. Tons of replication, which seems inefficient. Why is that inefficient? Because it takes up a, a ton of space in a lot of different places to keep, the, there's hamburger in two different places. Right. So if you were going to try and stock this, what a nightmare. OK, we need to refresh the hammer and meat. Oh, there's some there. Oh, there's some there. So while it's very useful for a buyer who doesn't know what they're wanting, maybe useful, although they can't necessarily find their meal if they have a, a hint of an idea of what they're looking for, it's terrible for a stock some, to, to stock this. So it's awful for finding something specific, stocking, variants. OK, so we can solve one of those problems. What if we make it easier to find things by sort of organizing meals by cuisines. So let's add some layers of organization here. So now I've put you know, my more American type meals here, my more Latin cuisine types here, my Italian cuisine types here. OK, is this better? It's a little better for finding and stocking. Why is that? A lot of the cuisines share common um, ingredients that now can be grouped together in the same area. That's right. So we simultaneously solved both an input problem and a selection problem. As a stalker of the grocery store, I'm a little bit more certain where the meat is, you know, where this kind of meat is going to go because it goes by cuisine. And as a finder, as a shopper, I kind of, if I, I can kind of go and grab one meal from this cuisine and one meal from that cuisine. Okay, so that solves some things. Um, I think it, thus it's even more awesome for browsers because now you can even get a variety when you choose. So I would like this grocery store organization. Um, but it has some of the same problems that you mentioned, which is variations. Where do variations go? The, you know, any combination, not to mention fusions um, or unclassifiable meals that are good, so you can leave them out. Um, so this is why almost every grocery store that you've ever walked into probably puts the major joint of the organization at a lower level as a kind of ingredient, right? So you've got your starches, which span cuisines and even types. You've got your proteins, um, condiments, dairy, beverages, um, pro produce. And this is really nice because it solves the problem of variance, right? Now it's really easy to know where to put things. Um, new things, you can figure out what they're closest to or you can start a new section. Finding th exactly what you're looking for if you're looking for an ingredient is much easier. And stocking it is much easier. So inputs are much easier. But for poor meal planners like me, grocery stores are totally overwhelming because I actually have no idea how to get the combination of ingredients to make the meal. So this is completely on the other extreme um, for the output, for the buyers, they have to do a lot more work to grab the things to make a meal. Make sense? So basically, there's sort of a tension between, say, a meal-based organization, which is what a shopper wants, and an ingredient-based or, uh, organization, which is easier for a store owner, and also for variants and things like that. So. I want to argue that this is almost <laughs> exactly like cortical organization. Whereas here is the floor plan where foodstuffs go in a grocery store. This is the floor plan where object information goes along inferior temporal cortex, the ventral stream. So just imagine this sort of scheme. This is like a swath of cortex right along the ventral stream. So it's similar in that it's constrained in two dimensions. It's got a 2D spatial layout. You can't put everything next to each other. You know, you have to kind of make decisions what goes nearby and what goes farther apart. And in the case of grocery store organization, the major dimension, as we walked through, for most grocery stores is by type of ingredient. 
And lots of things then fall out of that across different grocery stores. Some have bigger produce sections than others. And that sort of, that's the kind of variation you expect from grocery stores. OK, so when it comes to inferior temporal cortex, what's the major dimension? What are the major dimensions? We're still figuring that out. But we do know that there's a, a patch of cortex that's responsive to bodies more than anything else, pictures of bodies, to pictures of faces more than anything else. Um, to pictures of scenes more than anything else. And you're going to hear from Nancy later, I think. Nancy Kenwisher basically um, was seminal in discovering that these cortical modules exist. And so that made people think, well, maybe category, maybe object category is the same thing as this ingredient. But it turns out that's not true. If you look for a region that's responsive to cats more than anything else, or sunglasses more than anything else, or chairs, you don't find a localized region. But we know that information is in there in the patterns. So you can measure the response pattern to chairs and the response pattern to cats, and you can tell them apart. So the information's in there, but we just don't know how it's organized yet. And it's such a high dimensional question that you can't just look and see it. This is, the, this is where a lot of computer science comes in. So major dimension, still unknown. We're still working on that. Um, but we do know it's not basic level category. And some people have thought that there's so many different possible ways you can organize it. Yeah, yeah. How do you define basic level category? Good question. I totally assumed that you knew what that was, and I didn't say what it was. Um, this is a seminal work by Eleanor Roche in psychology. Basically, if you see this, what would you call this as? Cup. Good. If, if you saw this, what would you call this? Great. You could have said chocolate chip cookie. You could have said dessert. But you didn't. You said cookie. So basic level category is sort of the entry level category. Most observers, when they see something, they give it that name. Um, and it's usually, I don't know, there's lots of good research suggesting that that's got a, a sort of privileged status in terms of our psychological representations of our visual world, is the basic level category. Maximizes the similarity of things within it and, and maximally different, uh, is, is different from the other kinds of categories, sort of a sweet spot in that um, trade-off. That was a little vague, but hopefully you kind of got the intuition there. Did that answer your question? Yeah? Sort of. That's a good question. It's true. In fact, a lot of the work coming after that have gone, well, like if you know a lot about cookies and you're a cookie expert, then you say chocolate chip cookie because cookie is too vague. Um, you might say dessert. That's right. So good. Yet, yet further reasons why basic category may not be exactly the right cortical organization. Maybe just like grocery stores, we want meals. We want basic level categories, but the best way to organize it is by something that's one joint lower. Um, so the other point I wanted to make is that while ingredient type is sort of the dominant factor in the grocery store, you can see that there's multiple kinds of similarities. Like there's multiple ways you could group things that are useful. And you can see that tension all over the place. Next time you go in the grocery store, ch totally check it out. These are some of my favorites. So the first is almost always by the meat section, there's like a satellite section for mustard and buns. Because you're like going along, and you pick up your meat, and then you're like, dang it, I forgot the buns. And you have to go all the way back into the bread section to get them. And so they often put like just the core ingredients that are useful for meals in the satellite spots. So that means a stalker has to go and put mustard here and there. But that helps for the output needs for the shoppers. And that trade-off is worth it. I'm going to duplicate this information, but it's going to make the shoppers happier. So these are sort of like how information comes into the um, object cortex and what other regions need to get from it. And just like duplicated mustard, <laughs> there are duplicated regions in this cortex. So there's not just one region for faces, but there's actually reliably two. And there's not just one region for bodies, but there's two. One's bigger and one's smaller, kind of just like the sort of main condiment section and the satellite condiment section. So this idea could give you an intuition for why do we have two? Well, in the grocery store case, it's because there's sort of trade-offs between different organizational schemes. And some kinds of information are grouped together 
by kind and others by meal, and you can see those pressures in what is where. And I think you can see those pressures in what is where when you're looking at object cortex as well. And that's just one example, but there's lots of different, you can see this competing grouping, like how should we group things together? There's so many ways, like these are some snapshots from aisles, like breakfast, cereal, healthy food, <laughs> vegetables. It's quite a broad category to put next to each other amongst labels like breakfast and cereal and vegetables. Surely vegetables are healthy, never mind. Okay. Ethnic foods <laughs> next to canned tomatoes and fruits and vegetables. Here's a whole section where they've sort of captured that there's um, different cuisine types for condiments. So they've taken the condiment section within that. They've organized it by type, um, by culture. And then frozen sections are interesting. It's actually a complete duplication of all the fresh stuff, basically. So you can see where we put things actually really is dependent on how <laughs> Um, and how you need to get that information out, or food in and out. So groupings reflect pressures to keep similar things nearby. And so if we figure out what things are nearby in the cortex, that can help us understand the pressures, it can help us understand why they're organized that way. And, and the more we think about the input needs and the output needs, I think these are the sort of things that can help us solve this problem of how do we make sense of all our object knowledge. We know it's stored there, but we don't know how it's organized. So far, so good. People understanding the grocery store dilemma. 